Thank you for the invitation. So the topic today is going to be high risk uh, cerebral ALD. We're kind of going to go through what we call high risk, why do we call it high risk, why are we so cautious about it, what are the, some of the outcomes, and then throw in some science about maybe we should uh, redefine high risk. And uh, at the end, we'll touch on the importance of screening. These are my disclosures. So first of all, which ALD patients are eligible for transplant? Um, these are kind of the two biggest criteria. Patients with progressive cerebral ALD who are not too high risk. I put that in quotes because we'll define that in a bit. Generally, we think about it in terms of a less score less than 14 if, if people really need a number to go by, but it's very individualized. There's no official guideline uh, for this at all. It's more just practice. Uh, patients uh, who also have an active cerebral ALD process, which is defined by gadolinium enhancement on MRI, um, that'll make you transplant eligible, or an increase in lesion size over a period of time. Again, that's in quotes, because you can be gadolinium negative, but if your lesion is growing over months, that would also be criteria to go to transplant. So in either of those cases. So we have to talk a little bit about the scoring system for the MRIs. Uh, Dan last developed this at the University of Minnesota a number of years ago in the 90s. It's a 34-point based uh, scoring system, and it's based on the amount of diseased white matter. The points are awarded for anatomic structure, not for area. So if you have a small structure, you get the same amount of points as a large structure. Um, people often get that mixed up. And the gadolinium enhancement that we always talk about, that doesn't play any role at all in the scoring system. So here are some examples. Uh, on the uh, left side is a, a child with a low burden of disease. Um, is, what, is what we're looking at. This is score of one. Uh, there is a child with a standard splenial lesion. The score is 1.5. It kind of goes to one, point, one, to one side. Child uh, number three is a score about three. And then uh, the one over on the far right here is a score seven. Now, why is that child a score seven? Kind of looks like a three. If you, if you go further down in the MRI, you've got some of these small structures. Those are structures in the brainstem affected by disease, and those points add up quickly. So that's how that child got to a seven so fast, even though at the higher level, he looks like a three. And then finally, here's a child with uh, greater than 15, either 17 or 19, with lots of white matter involvement in the front, in the back, in various cuts, white matter is involved, cortical spinal tracts, their temporal lobe, so um, very high score. So I, and again, I think it was 17 or 19 or something like that. So. so that's our definition of scoring. The other thing we use to measure disease burden is the neurologic function score, uh, which is points are given for uh, neurologic dysfunction. So we all start off at a, at a zero, but if you have hearing or auditory problems, you get a point. If you have uh, vision field cuts, you get a point. If you have um, history of seizures, there's a point. Running difficulty, a point. Spasticity, a point. Uh, on and on and on. Episodes of incontinence. And, and so you can get t to 25 points. Usually having one point is not necessarily a good thing. So, uh, and then greater than one point um, really uh, portends to uh, um, not as good outcomes. So, why is it? So we define higher risk or high risk as scored about 10. Why is that? 
Um, you don't really find it written down anywhere, but if you just look at a body of boys, say a hundred of them that show up to clinic, and then you and then you parse them by their neurologic function score on the y-axis, uh, and then say low risk is less than 10, and high risk is 10 or greater, they actually separate into two groups. And it's, it's as simple as that. They kind of separate themselves. And so you don't see a lot of symptoms before you hit a score of 10. There are a few boys in the low risk group that have a higher score, but the large majority are scores of zero. Some of these boys may have had a seizure, they get a point for that, and maybe just the starting of um, some processing, and they get a point for that. But by and far, once you hit 10, the symptoms come in um, fairly rapidly. Uh, and so that's why the score of 10 is kind of our higher risk definition, because the groups just kind of fall apart in that direction. And so we talk about 10 being the high risk or higher risk, and then we talk about 14, 15 onward being very high risk. So how do these boys perform uh, at various scores? So, so this is change in score from pre-transplant to one year post-transplant. So a boy will come in at a certain score for neurologic function, and then one year later he'll be at another score. So that's the change. And then the bottom is the pre-transplant score. And then I put a line right at 10. And so what, what you can see, if you come in at a neurologic function score of 10, or, or the bottom is a less score, sorry. If you come in with a less score of 10, you actually gain a lot of points after transplant. You can see some boys gained you know, two points, three points, 10 points, 15 points, but some boys gain you know, 18, 20 points, and they're clearly uh, very, very affected. If you come in with a less score less than 10, so that low risk group, you don't gain as many points at all. So again, these groups just kind of auto-separate based on that scoring of 10. And so we consider that score of nine and lower to be lower risk because these boys don't change as much after transplant. Ideally, they should gain no points, but sometimes they gain a point or two. And occasionally there are some boys that didn't fare as well, even though their MRI score was less than 10. So the, the bottom here should read MRI score, not, not NFS. So what about other outcomes uh, just based on the MRI score or the less score? Just looking at survival, if you have a less score less than 10, this is a survival score, and the survival is much, much better than if your score is greater than 10. Uh, and this is this statistically significant looking at years post-transplant. Another reason why we kind of use 10 as our cutoff. Um, this is survival based on neurologic function score. So if you come in with no symptoms, Again, your, survi your survival after transplant is superior. If you come in with, with an NFS of one, you actually take a step down. And if you're greater than one, so if two or more symptoms, you actually take a couple of steps down. So you know, catching this disease earlier is always gonna be better, uh, hence the push for newborn screening, which would be the earliest time possible. What else can we look at? Uh, this is just looking at less scores less than 10 using a related donor, so a, a sister survival in this uh, cohort of, of patients was 100%. And if your less scores less than 10 with an unrelated donor, you take a step down. <clears throat> and this is the use of n acetylcysteine a potent antioxidant that, <coughs> that we use uh, for boys that have very high less scores or a higher risk, so when their scores are 10 or higher. Um, this is survival with n acetylcysteine and then without, and n acetylcysteine does provide some survival benefit. We're not exactly sure of the mechanism, but probably something to do with its anti-inflammatory uh, antioxidant uh, abilities. And so, it, to reemphasize, like the score matters, um, and so this is looking at change in median less score. Uh, depending on how you came in. So on the left, you have less score transplant less than six 
or greater than or equal to six. And this is your change in less score two years out from transplant. So if you came in at less than six, your change in MRI score is gonna be a one point. If you came in greater than six, your median change is gonna be three more points after transplant. And that's about one and a half, two years after transplant. So again, the score matters and coming in with a lower burden of disease is gonna portend a much better outcome. Uh, what else can I say about that? So we can separate the patients again by this high risk category, a score of 10. So coming in with a score of, 10, of less than 10, and now this is looking at NFS in the far column, so symptomatology. If you came in with a less score of less than 10, your change in NFS, your median change is zero points. So those children did exceedingly well. They didn't gain any, gain any symptoms at a median of about three years after transplant. The children that came in at 10 or greater than 10, they gained up to seven and a half points in NFS, which is a lot of symptomatology. So that's probably seizures, that's probably cortical, or that's probably field cuts, maybe blindness, that's probably aphasia, apyaxia, uh, probably a movement disorder, spasticity problems, walking, running. So there's seven points right there. Um, so again, giving us uh, evidence that uh, earlier is way, way better when we're talking about outcomes and what will happen after transplant. So let's take a closer look at 10 being our risk score. So this is just the demographics of a bunch of boys I looked at, about 68 boys. And we looked at their MRI progression after transplant. The red lines are the boys who came in at a score of 10 or higher. And blue is less than 10, so the classic definition of higher risk. And you can look at how they gain points after transplant at 30, 60, 100 days, six months, and one year after transplant. And you can see that the, the red lines all go up pretty high, and the blue lines are fairly flat, as you'd, as you'd expect. But there's a couple of kiddos right in the middle that are kind of throwing the whole curve off. These blue guys. Those blue guys right there are kind of shooting up in scores. They didn't do very well. So I thought, is there a better way we can define risk? If you actually average all the uh, lines here in terms of their slope, these are the slopes you get. You get a blue line, you get a red line for low risk, high risk. And it turns out in this analysis, the slopes are different. Well, if these were truly two different risk groups, the slopes actually should be different you would expect the red line to be steeper than the blue line, but the statistical analysis doesn't vet that, the way these groups are laid out. So what we did, and there's the statistics, what we did is change the score. So now we said anyone greater than eight is high risk, anyone eight or less is low risk. And now you can see the red and blue lines they actually separate. So the red all stay together, the blue all stay together. There's like, you know, one or two overlap, but there's a much cleaner picture. So the groups are parsed apart much better this way. Now we can average the lines. And if you look at the slopes, the red line is much steeper than the blue line. And the statistics that we apply show that to be true statistically. So now we actually probably better define risk groups in terms of progression. And that's using a score of eight and less for low risk, not nine and less. That score probably works better. So you know, why do all this? It's, it's, it's interesting, it's entertaining, but, but why do that? Well, it might help us uh, better predict MRI progression after transplant and really help us counsel families on what to expect, because it's usually the number one question I get um, during our pre-transplant meetings. And it helps us predict symptom progression after transplant. Uh, and it might be useful for future clinical trial design. Could be transplant, could be gene therapy, could be small molecules. Uh, and so now, so this is the, this is the same graph I showed you. Again, the, the bottom axis should be MRI score, not NFS. So that's the 10, 
These boys are on the, the 10 and higher on the right. Their NFS after transplant is not great. But you see, we have a couple of boys here, maybe three boys, that also didn't do well. Well, if we move our high risk definition now down to nine and higher and eight and lower, you see everybody eight and lower did fairly well with very low accumulation of symptoms and everybody at nine and higher actually is truly high risk. So that might be a better uh, way to define high risk. And then I was just gonna comment on gadolinium. Uh, what is it? It's a heavy metal. We infuse it during the MRIs. And it usually is supposed to stay in your blood vessels unless you have blood-brain barrier breakdown, and then it leaks out and causes a smudge. And then in the case of cerebral ALD, it causes a garland ring of enhancement. Which is surrounding uh, the lesion. You can think of this as like the forest fire, and behind it is all the destruction, in front of it is the new forest. Um, and then what transplant does is this is the same child, 30 days after transplant, that gadolinium enhancement is completely gone. Uh, and so that's our goal, that's what we call remission for cerebral ALDs. So I put together a list of all the things I've tried to treat high risk boys with. And this is a partial list, but from memory, it's IVIG. I've tried to inject steroids in the spinal column. I've tried to use mesenchymal stem cells in the spinal column. I've tried immunosuppressants. I've tried PDE inhibitors, anakindra, other immunosuppressants, Campath, serolimus, Tisabre, more dexamethasone and pulse formation, dexamethasone immun and Jacophy, and other immunosuppressant, plus bevacizumab, fingolimod. I even tried chemotherapy using just fludarabine by itself without a transplant. These are all completely failed in treating high-risk boys. Uh, so the question is, why did we fail? Um, why couldn't we achieve what transplant does in terms of gadolinium? And I tried to sum that up in just one figure. Uh, and that's because if you look at whether or not you resolve the gadolinium, or the gadolinium goes away, by the amount of donor cells you have in your circulation after an allo transplant, it turns out the more donor cells you have, the more likely that gadolinium is to go away. Leading us to believe that, in fact, it is that donor cell that's very important. And if you don't have enough of them, your gadolinium is not gonna go away. And this could be true for allotransplant, but also gene therapy. So you need to have those corrected cells. So it's not just immune suppression and steroids and all these other things. It's something to do with the donor cell as well that helps us have good transplant outcomes. And so this just summarizes uh, that. And is it important that the gadolinium goes away? That's what this graph kind of tries to answer. This is the change in your neurologic function score from pre-transplant to one year post. And this is the question on the bottom is, is the gadolinium gone at 60 days after transplant? The patients who the answer was yes, they have a much better neurologic outcome than the patients whose answer is no to that question. So the faster we can get the gadolinium to go away, the better the neurologic outcome. So uh, the conclusion here is that high-risk boys going to transplant have poor outcomes. Gadolinium resolution uh, is really due to early stem cell engraftment. Early GAD resolution correlates with better outcomes. Is there a way to arrest disease more rapidly, especially when the boys are advanced? Um, are we thinking about this incorrectly? Is the horse already out of the barn for the advanced boys? And so the final slide just really addresses why newborn screen matters and why high-risk boys progress. This is a newborn with ALD. We know it takes probably about four years, five years, six years to develop the adrenaline sufficiency. Um, and then it probably takes another couple years, up to about age seven historically, to develop the MRI findings. So that damage has to accumulate. And then it's X years to get to a score of 10, and then the symptoms occur, which we just went through, and with the outcomes that uh, we're, uh, I described. 
There is maybe a fast track to uh, looking at various uh, outcomes, and that's looking at IQ. We have found the evidence that scores of four, four and a half, actually those boys don't perform as well on IQ tests. That, that may actually be a much earlier marker of disease development than the MRI. Uh, and so some of that data is published already. Uh, but again, this is why screening is so important, because you don't want these boys to be at a score of 10 coming to transplant. You want them to be at a score of 0.5 or 1 should they need to go to transplant. That portends much superior outcomes. So that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you.